in Portland, Oregon. This is our weekly jam session. However, today is a special live question and answer session where you can type in questions to me and I will answer them as best as I can live. And this is something we tried out about a month ago and it was very successful. So we thought we would make this tra the tradition to do the first Wednesday of every month. Now, wait, you're saying this isn't the first Wednesday of the month. And you're right, last week, because we had had a technical glitch the week before, I wanted to get in one more regular jam session. So we postponed it to today back in November, or sorry, next month in November, we'll be back to the first Wednesday of each month will be our weekly jam session. Sorry, will be our monthly live Q&A session. First Wednesday of the month will be question and answer. The rest of the month on Wednesdays will be our regular jam session. So hopefully that's clear as mud and we can get to our questions. Oh, one more announcement. We've had some requests to get a tour of Hoffman Academy. And so if you wait to the end of this question and answer session, at the end of this, in about 30 minutes, I will do a tour of Hoffman Academy of Music here in Portland. You may or may not know that here in Portland, we serve about 250 students who come weekly to lessons with our 12 teachers who teach piano, voice, and guitar lessons. Although during COVID, we've switched to remote only lessons. So right now, Hoffman Academy is very empty and barren. It's kind of a lonely place here. I do most of my work from home, but I do come in for these because I have a special setup uh, that I've been using for my streaming. So if you wanna wait around to the end, we'll be doing a little tour and you can see what Hoffman Academy Portland looks like. Okay, I'm going to go to my phone. And by the way, if you want to ask a question, you need to be doing that through our Facebook page. Some of you watch this live stream from our YouTube channel. We also stream this on YouTube and you're free to watch on YouTube. However, uh, you won't be able to type in questions there. If you want to actually type in a question for me to answer, uh, you need to go to facebook.com slash Hoffman Academy slash live and that's where I'm streaming right now. So let me see what kind of questions we have today. Uh, Paul asks, how old is my son? I have two sons and they are 14 and 13 years old. Teresa asks, how do you compose without copying a song or accidentally copying a song? That's a really great question, Teresa. I know I've sat down and started playing a melody that I'm like, oh, this is so beautiful. I love this. And then I realized, wait a minute, this sounds just like some other melody that I was basically just copying. The good news is that mathematicians have done calculations and found that there are truly trillions upon trillions of possible musical combinations. So we're never gonna run out basically of music that could be written. There are just so many possible combinations. Now, yes, uh, there is a chance that because you've heard a melody and you don't realize it when you're, you're composing, like I've experienced that, but uh, if you are obviously trying to be original and also remember that great artists and great musicians are always borrowing and taking inspiration from other melodies. One thing you should know is you cannot copyright a chord progression. You can copyright a melody. I think it constitutes, you know, it, you're breaking the law if you copy like I think it's like eight notes in a row from a melody verbatim. Maybe it's 10. I can't remember what the threshold is, but you can't copy someone else's melody, but you can copy someone else's chord progression. And that's because there are kind of a finite number of possible chord progressions that are just 
reasonable or possible in music. And so they've decided you cannot copyright a chord progression. So if you hear a chord progression that you really like, I mean, and we talked about this at a jam session recently, that there, there are some famous chord progressions. I won't write them up. Well, I can just show you. One of them is one, four, six, five. You can hear that chord progression in probably 500 different pop songs. And so obviously, you know, there's no problem with borrowing chord progressions. Uh, but yeah, just try your best to be original, but also don't be afraid. It is okay to say copy three notes of a melody. Like I said, as long as you don't get up to like eight to 10 notes, you know, if you hear an idea from another song or piece that you really like, use that as some inspiration and a springboard to uh, create your own melodies. So that's a really great question from Teresa. And I hope you do keep composing. It's a really wonderful skill to develop. Uh, let's see. Afton asks from New Jersey, when and why did I decide to start piano? And Afton is 10. Thanks for that question. I started piano when I was six years old because my mother and my sister started doing piano lessons and I thought that seemed cool and so I wanted to do it too. I often was interested in the same things my two older sisters were interested in uh, because I thought they were neat, interesting people and I wanted to be like them and so that's what first got me into it. And that's a great question. And I, I want to say up front that I'm not going to be able to answer all the questions because there will probably be too many that we can cover in 30 minutes. But again, we'll do this again next month. So I'm going to kind of pick and choose. I'm going to try to focus mostly on music or piano related questions. If there are questions more about just my personal life, you know, I may or may not uh, get to those. I want to focus mostly on music. Uh, let's see. Vincent in Iowa is asking for an explanation of C and D major arpeggio. He's in unit one. Vincent, that's a great question. And I realize one thing I need to fix in my video lessons and print materials is that in my print materials that you can download and print out and do all those theory pages, on those materials, we use the term arpeggio, but I don't think I use that term in the video lesson, and that might be why you're confused. I've been wanting to go back and refilm those lessons and actually use that term. It's a useful term that you're going to hear a lot as a pianist. Basically, an arpeggio in music is a broken chord, and chords in music are usually made up of triads. It's like if you can see my piano, I know it's a little bit far away, but I'm using my built-in camera so I can't really move it around very much. Uh, if you can see these notes, here's a C major triad, which is built on do, mi, and so. And if I play those one at a time like that, that's called an arpeggio. It's basically just do, mi, so makes a, an arpeggio. That's one way you can make an arpeggio is just playing the notes of the chord one at a time. That's the simplest kind of arpeggio. When you get to higher levels, you can find that you can keep that arpeggio going up, up, up. Like if you're in unit, I think, nine, you start doing a two octave C major arpeggio like this, where you go all the way up and down. Okay, and that's called a C major two octave arpeggio. But if you're in unit one, we're just keeping it simple to these three notes. Do, mi, so. If you play those three notes one at a time, you just play the C major arpeggio. And D major is like this. Do, mi, so. So again, we took do, mi, so and put D as do. And that makes a D major arpeggio. That's a great question, Vincent. And I hope you keep going all the way up to unit 11 where you'll be playing a full two octave arpeggio and beyond. We have some of our students all the way in unit 14 now. And I'm gonna keep making more units. Maybe by the time you get there, we'll be all the way up to unit 20. 
Okay. Abby is nine. Hi, Abby. And you're saying your hands are too small to play the chords for lesson part three of Fur Elise. Is there anything I can do to help me play part three? Yeah, that's a great question, Abby. Uh, I'm glad you're trying that challenging song. Fur Elise is a really advanced, really special piece, in my opinion. And you want to be careful that when you're learning an advanced song that you don't do it in a way that's going to create tension in your hand. And sometimes if you're doing an advanced song, there may be like a big stretch or something. I think there are ways you can try and navigate it. Let me see if I can show you from here. Like uh, those places where the left hand is doing this kind of thing where you've got to maybe do a big, big stretch. And what I really want to encourage you to do, Abby, is to not think about it as a stretch. Think of them one note at a time and you're gonna shift your hand from note to note. You're not gonna try and touch all of those notes at the same time. Like when we do in a pentascale, your fingers can all just comfortably rest on those five keys. And that's very comfortable and so it's fine. But when you get to more advanced music and your fingers are going from note to note to note, you can't possibly touch all those keys at the same time because it's going to stretch your fingers apart and that won't be very comfortable. So just think of shifting as you play this first note, then shift to the next note, shift to the next note, shift, shift, shift. So your fingers are always staying in the most relaxed position possible and you're just gliding from note to note. And again, really avoiding think, feeling like you've got to touch more than one note at a time. Just worry about the one note you're playing and let your arm and hand and wrist shift from note to note to note as you play. Try that out and you want to find a way to do that where it feels really comfortable. If it doesn't feel comfortable, I would suggest maybe waiting until your hands are are a little bigger because you never want piano playing to hurt or to feel uncomfortable. You know, sometimes it's a little bit of an exercise, like we talk about in some of the lessons, to exercise those finger joints, but it's never painful. If you're feeling pain or discomfort, uh, you might want to find a more relaxed way to do it. But that's a really great question, Abby. Um, oh, someone's mentioning, am I reserving part of the Q&A for kids? I'm kind of doing it more free form today. I will mix it up. Kids or adults are all welcome to ask questions. Uh, let's see. Someone, Valerie is asking, whenever I play the black keys, my fingers often slip off of them. It's been driving me crazy. Is this normal? Do you have any advice on this matter? I've been getting a little better. For example, I've been practicing harvest dance a lot. Yeah, harvest dance uh, does have a lot of black keys, doesn't it? You're like almost completely on the black keys. Now for black keys, well, I have to tell you a funny story. I was playing a concert one time where there was like a thousand people in the audience. And Valerie, you are not alone because I was playing the piano for my choir and my finger slipped off one of the black keys and it hit the white key right next to it and it sounded awful. Like, I like, oh, I was so embarrassed because it just sounded terrible for that one note. It would have been one thing if I'd played it really soft, but because it slipped off of the black key, it hit it really loud. And I was like, ah, oh, it was terrible. But I had a great choir director and he just kept right on going and the choir kept right on going and I realized, hey, mistakes happen and music you can't break music, right? The great thing about music is, you know, no one ever gets hurt. I played a wrong note and, you know, big deal. So, uh, but just know that I'm aware of this problem because I've experienced it in a, in a performance nonetheless. Uh, what can you do about that? I like to think of one thing that can help is keeping your fingers close to the keys. And by that, I mean, you know, when we talk about good piano posture, we're often talking about keeping your fingers in this kind of shape. And one of the reasons for that is just because it's a more natural shape and so it avoids tension. But another reason is to keep the fingers close to the keys. If your fingers are like this and coming up off the keys, there's more of a chance that you'll miss 
the next key. But if you keep your fingers in close but comfortable contact with the key that you're about to play, that will help uh, anchor onto that key. And again, you don't want to do it in a tense way. You want to find a way that feels really comfortable. But I find if I keep my fingers really close to the keys, that can help. So try that out, Valerie, and see what that does for you. Let's see here. Louisa and Sophia are in Sydney. Thanks for watching today. And uh, you're on units three and four. That's fantastic. That's wonderful. Keep it up. I'm not seeing a question, so I guess you're just saying hello, and I appreciate your comment. Thanks, and please keep up your great work. Uh, let's see. Again, I'm going to skip around a little bit. Sorry, I'm not going to be able to get to all of your questions. Samaria. Eight years old in Holland, Michigan, is asking how many keys are on a grand piano? That's a great question. This is a digital piano. At home, I have a small baby grand piano, and it turns out they have the same number of keys. Uh, maybe you should count them yourself. How fast can you count? <laughs> Actually, that's probably a lot to count. If you add up all the white keys and black keys on a typical piano, there are 88 keys total. It's kind of a cool number, right? 88. And that's true for almost all pianos. There are some very special pianos that have some extra low keys, but those are very rare. Standard size for both acoustic and grand and digital pianos is 88 keys. Now, some electric keyboards have less keys than that, uh, but those usually would be called a keyboard, not a digital piano. Great question. Let's see here. Someone's asking, where is the Hedwig's theme accompaniment? That's a good question. I saw that question come up. I'm gonna take a look. I think you might need to be a premium member to access that accompaniment. And, but I can't remember where it is. So let me look for that and I'll try and get back to you on that one. That's a really good one. Uh, Daria is asking, when are you planning to make a video lesson on Pirates of the Caribbean? That's a great question. Well, it turns out that I've recently published a new collection with Hal Leonard called Mr. Hoffman's Hits for Piano. Hold on, I should show you in case you haven't seen it. was really, really excited to have this book come out. And it has Pirates of the Caribbean, Caribbean, however you say it, inside. That's one of the pieces. Let's see, where is it? He's a pirate from, which is the main theme from Pirates of the Caribbean. And we are going to be coming out with a tutorial that goes over this. We, we for copyright reasons, can't teach the whole thing in the video but you can uh, purchase this book online from the Hal Leonard website. And, uh, and be able to learn that theme. So uh, that's, uh, when is that tutorial going to come out? I can't say, Daria, but we have it scheduled. And it could be a few months, but I'd encourage you to get this book. This could be good sight reading practice for you. And you can try teaching yourself. I think you could handle it. Let's see. Ilona, who's eight years old in unit two, is asking, how did I come up with so many jokes? <laughs> I assume you're talking about the finger puppets at the end. And well, it's uh, sometimes it takes me a long time to think of what I'll just be sitting in my chair and thinking and thinking. And I'll think about what did I teach in that lesson? And was there something interesting in the lesson that I could turn into a joke? Sometimes I get a silly idea from one of my sons or from another student. Um, kids have great creative ideas. So sometimes I get a good idea from them. Uh, just life, you know, from maybe a movie I watched. It's If you're looking for 
funny things in your life, you know, life will present you with good opportunities to laugh if you're watching for them. So I try to always keep an eye out for something that would be fun to turn into a joke because uh, the Finger Puppet friends and I, we've, we have lots of fun making those jokes at the end. How do you draw the bass and treble clef? And are we doing the tour today? Asks Noel, who's 10. Yes, we are doing the tour today. You just need to wait another 10 minutes and then I'm actually going to have to sign off and then restart the Facebook Live. So it may kick you out and then you'll have to just either stay on the page or jump back in. I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen, but uh, because I'm not going to be able to carry around this computer that I'm streaming from, I'm going to switch to streaming from my phone. So we are going to do the tour though. How do you draw a treble clef? Well, there's a couple ways you can do it. Um, one way is to start by doing this line and then adding the dot at the bottom. And then you go back to the top and you curve around and do a little spiral. That's one way to do it. Uh, a more quick way to do it is to actually start here and you just go, you do a spiral out, up and around like that. And I make it look easy, right? Because I've drawn probably about a thousand of these in my lifetime, you know. Because when I compose, I'm like drawing a treble clef on the start of each line practically. So it takes practice, but just like you learned to write your alphabet, at first it probably was very slow and tedious, and now you can write letters, I'm sure, very quickly. So again, just practice it. You can choose your technique. I've seen composers who go down and then whoop, and they'll do it like that. Oh, you couldn't see that. Down, and then you do the little spiral. Or you can start in the middle, go up, and around like that, okay? Treble clef. And bass clef is even easier. You just make a dot, you loop around, and then add two dots on either side of the F line. Like if that's your F line, make sure the dots go above and below the F line. Great question, Noel. Let's see. Iris is wondering, is there a way to send a video without everyone in the world seeing it? Uh, that's a good question. I guess you could send a video if you like saved it as a video file on your computer and then sent it to like support at hoffmanacademy.com and our support people could pass it along to me. That's one way you could do it. I think that should work. Let's see, who helps me do the puppet shows, asks Gan uh, in Unit 8, age 9. Great question. Well, most of the time I'm doing them myself. Like I do all the voices actually, believe it or not. And my, uh, my fingers can handle up to like four people at a time. But sometimes I need someone to come from the side or from underneath. Uh, and when that happens, I need to bring a helper or a friend. And I've had actually the last, hmm, the last finger puppet, actually it's gonna come out, no, it came out yesterday. The last video in unit 14, 262, Sharky is being played by my son, Isaac, and I'm Princess and Scuba. So sometimes I get Isaac to help. I've had teachers at the academy come and help. It's always a lot of fun. And Nick Boxwell is always behind the camera. He's uh, my camera guy and does all the editing as well. Let's see, is the Yamaha P45 a good piano? Uh, I'm not super familiar with the P45, but I'm pretty sure that's a good one. If I'm remembering correctly, I believe that one has 88 weighted keys, and that's the number one thing I'm looking for. If you ask me, hey, Mr. Hoffman, what's a good digital piano? I would ask you, does it have 88 weighted keys? That means there's gonna be a little bit of resistance to feel like a real acoustic piano. Because if you get a keyboard without weighted keys, then your fingers aren't going to develop the same amount of strength. And then when you go to play on a real piano, it's gonna feel really hard and you're gonna be frustrated. And I don't want that for you. I want you to have the finger strength to be able to play on any piano, real or digital. 
And for that, you need weighted keys. And I think the P45 does have weighted keys, if I'm remembering correctly, but double check that. And Yamaha is a good brand. So I like my favorite keyboard brands are Casio Privy. If it's a Casio keyboard, I'm not so excited about it because those don't have weighted keys, but the Privia made by Casio is good. Yamaha's generally are really good. Uh, Kawai makes a really good digital piano and Roland makes a good digital piano. There might be a couple others, but those are the four that are the most reliable that I've been really happy with when I've tried them out. Okay. In Opus 36, what is the Sonatina number in sonnet of Sonatina in C? It's, I think, number one, but now I'm questioning myself. Opus 36, number one. I'm gonna have to look that up. That is a good question. Um, Opus 36, I wanna say that it's number one. Let's see, what other questions do we have? Hello to James and Rebecca in Virginia. I'm glad you guys are watching and they are asking, or James would like to know what the black keys are called. That's a great question. The black keys have names too, and they're called sharps and flats. Basically, Remember it this way, if you get poked with something sharp, ow, you kind of jump up. And so a sharp always raises a note by one half step up on your piano. Remember up is to the right on your piano. So if I say C and then want to turn that into a C sharp, I'm going to go to the nearest possible key to the right. And it could be black or it could sometimes be white, but it will usually be a black. And so you can just go to this nearest black key, and that is what we call C sharp. Now, if you get a flat, think of getting a flat tire. Your car is gonna sink down, right, if you have a flat tire. So flats always go down on the piano. So let's take this white key here, which we call G, to find G flat. You find the nearest key to the left of that note, white or black, and in most cases it's a black, so I'm gonna go right there, and this key right here is G flat. And so that's how you name the black keys. And if you play the game, if you're a premium member and play Piano Street on, in the game section of our website and get to a high enough level, then you'll start getting to practice some sharps and flats as well. And so that's something you could shoot for. Uh, let's see. I'll have time for maybe, uh, looks like I have time, two more minutes or so. Let's see if we can squeeze in a few more quick questions. How often do you tune my baby grand piano at home? I find I need to tune it about once a year. If I go longer than that, it starts to sound a little twangy and that's pretty typical. A piano tuner will tell you twice a year is like the gold standard, but I find that you know, that I'm not quite noticing, and it can depend on the piano too. Some pianos hold a tune really well. If you haven't had it tuned for a long time, you may need to get it tuned and then get it tuned again, like the next month, just to kind of uh, teach, you've got to kind of train a piano to hold the tune. So on average, about once a year, but I would talk to a piano technician and uh, ask for their advice on your specific piano. Let's see. <laughs> so it's asking me a joke. What has 18 legs and catches flies? Hmm. Thinking like a spider with 10 extra legs or something. I don't know, how do I find the answer? Oh, that's from Daniel. So you'll have to tell us the answer to that. Uh, and then last one, and then we'll do our tour. Where is the recital hall? I've mentioned in some of the video lessons, like posting a lesson to our recital hall. We used to have a part of our website called the recital hall, where you could upload videos excuse me, of yourself playing. 
but that broke at some point. Websites have a way of occasionally having a feature that breaks and then usually, of course, if something breaks, we fix it right away. But in this case, we decided to move to uh, just asking people to share on Facebook so we could build our Facebook community. Facebook has some nice tools for leaving comments and so that's why you can't find our online recital halls. It doesn't exist anymore. We're possibly going to bring it back, but for right now, Facebook seems to have been a, a good temporary solution. And please note, we have a private Facebook group. I think it's called uh, Parents and Students of Hoffman Academy or something like that. If you do a search, it's a private group, but you can request to join and uh, then a moderator can let you in. And that's a great place to share videos with our community. Uh, they're not visible publicly, but anyone who belongs to that community can see. And it's a very supportive, friendly community that uh, is encouraging and you can share and get comments and ask questions. And it's uh, something I would highly recommend participating in if you're looking for a community and a place to share videos. One thing that you get with a live piano teacher is that kind of community where occasionally you do recitals. And this is one way that we can create our own community. And it's a really great way to be inspired by seeing other performers who are maybe further along than you. It's a great way for younger students to be inspired and a great place to share your performances with the world. Uh, that's all I have time today for questions. Thank you so much for all of your questions. They were all very thoughtful and interesting. And we'll do this again the first Wednesday of November. So please come back then. And next Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific, we'll be back to our regular jam session where I'll do a little improv lesson and we will make some music together. That will be every week, again, except for the first Wednesday of the month, which will be for this kind of question and answer session. Because I think it's a, a great chance to interact and hear from you. Uh, let's do a tour. So what I'm gonna have to do is stop this stream and then I'm gonna start a new stream from my phone which I can then carry around and show you all the rooms of Hoffman Academy. So if you want to join for that, just uh, stay on our Facebook page and I won't be streaming this one on YouTube. So you'll need to go over to our Facebook page and find facebook.com slash Hoffman Academy slash live and it should stream. Uh, so we're gonna interrupt this program now and then hopefully be right back on my phone. Let's see if this works. We'll do the tour.